Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Uh, Ashley Murphy is my guest tonight. She's an award-winning arts and cultural journalist um, who wrote a really interesting op-ed about polls and, uh, and, and her experience in a call center. So she's a journalist and has an experience actually working in a call center during, I think it was the 2016 presidential election in the United States. And so she's got some really interesting views on uh on polls, uh, she is, as, as I said, a cultural journalist. Um, she's an award-winning theater critic, uh, but she's also comfortable writing about everything from provincial politics to internet trends. Uh, and she was recently recognized as a finalist for the 2024 RT DNA Award for her contributions to CTV News Toronto's uh, Kenneth Law investigation. Uh, when she's not uh, reviewing plays or investigating local politicians, she dabbles in freelance editing, social media management, dramaturgy what the heck is dramaturgy and document design welcome to the show yeah thanks so much for having me so tell me what what was the the premise of the the op-ed that you wrote yeah so i uh, am american i moved to canada in 2016 uh, to go to the university of ottawa for my theater degree um, and when I first got to U Ottawa, I needed a, you know, just a, a part-time minimum wage job, just, you know. Um, and there was a call center really, really close to the University of Ottawa that was hiring. And I thought, well, okay, I'm studying theater. I can read a script pretty fluidly. Sure, that sounds like a good fit. Um, and so I started working at this call center. And at first we it was all surveys. Like, you know, we were calling people in Ontario to ask how they felt about their garbage collection and, you know, kind of silly mundane things like that. Um, but then, you know, kind of October 2016 rolled around and suddenly we were calling Americans on behalf of CNN to talk about the election and, and to poll Americans about who they were going to vote for. Um, so in this story, which I wrote for the Toronto Star, um, I sort of recalled the feeling of seeing, you know, in the press how, uh, you know, very positive these polls were towards uh, Hillary Clinton and her campaign. But then, of course, the kind of heartbreak that kind of came along in November of 2016, when, of course, Donald Trump was elected into office. Um, so in this op-ed, I kind of argued like, hey, you know, polls, they're super useful for analysts and pundits. They're a great tool to kind of check in to see how a campaign is doing at any given moment. But by no means should they be an indication of whether or not an individual should vote for whoever or whatever they believe in. Um, polls can be really misleading. Um, I say that as someone who really was on the other side of them during such a uh, kind of dramatic election, like the administering those polls was a really kind of crazy life experience. I got a lot of death threats. I got a lot of people who were very not happy that um, what they considered to be the mainstream media was uh, call, calling their house and asking about the election. So yeah, for this op-ed, I really just kind of got into it. And given that there's another pretty dramatic election taking place right now, it, it seemed like an important experience. And it's certainly one that I've been ruminating quite uh, on quite a bit for the past couple of months. You've been ruminating on your experience as a pollster. Yeah, one hundred percent. It was a pretty formative uh, experience for my adulthood. I would say thinking that what you were doing a, a benefit to society or a negative to society. Um, I don't really know if I thought about it in those terms. I mean, at the end of the day, like I, I hadn't signed up to work for any sort of like political campaign, right? Like it really was just a minimum wage job that happened to become very high stakes in in the month or two after I took it. Um, so I, you know, I, I suppose I've just been thinking about it in the context of, you know, we're seeing polls now that are very increasingly favorable towards Kamala Harris. For me, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic about that. But then I also know for a fact that um, surveys and pre-election polls can be really misleading, you know, in my experience, at least. If I called a household that was potentially voting for Donald Trump, for instance, um, the second I would say I was calling on behalf of CNN, uh, folks would get kind of angry and and not necessarily want to participate because it was CNN. Um, so like I, I see the numbers that uh, folks are talking about currently that are showing more and more support for the Harris campaign. And that's great. I just also know that by no means, you know, just because someone looks like they may, might win because of a poll, that doesn't mean that people shouldn't still go out and vote. Of course they should. So you're saying that uh, polls may be biased because people will respond differently or not respond at all, depending on who the sponsor of the poll is, whether it's CNN or Fox or someone else? 
that's part of it for sure. Um, something that came up in the research for uh, this op-ed as well, um, th there's a bit of a phenomenon where uh, survey respondents will be less likely to engage truthfully with a survey if it's something that they may be deemed embarrassing. Um, so often surveys that are maybe dealing uh, with things like household income, education, you know, kind of demographic stuff like that, people might be inclined to sort of misrepresent uh, their experience just because they might there might be some sort of stigma attached to it. And I think we've seen that for Donald Trump voters. There's, you know, there there is a bit of a stigma attached to voting for Trump in some parts of the world. And uh, people may not be as forthcoming about their true political opinions if they think that the person on the other end of the phone is judging them. Um, I was so in uh, New okay. York State recently, <laughs> and I was shocked at the number of uh, you know, Trump country uh, signs that I saw. There was a, uh, there were, you know, even in neighborhoods that I thought would have been typically Democratic, um, there's a lot of Trump support down there. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, uh, there there are certainly pockets of of the U.S. that are very much like that. Uh, where I'm from in Maryland, uh, Maryland is generally a fairly blue state, but of course there are you know pockets of the state that uh, tend to go very red as well. So I mean, there's definitely still a lot of support for Donald Trump in the U.S. Um, and I find it to be, you know, we need to remember that even if that's not what people see immediately within or just outside their own political bubbles, there's stuff far beyond, far beyond those bubbles and, and there, there's support for both candidates kind of all. So, over the country. so <laughs> what's your, what's your recommendation to people that are reading these polls on a regular basis? Yeah. I mean, I'm like that too, right? Like I, I check the polls probably every couple of days because I'm interested in seeing how the election is going. It's just, you know, those polls, they show how people are feeling right now. Um, they show how they're feeling at this point in, in the media cycle and based on, you know, what they may have seen on, on the news this morning or last night, they don't necessarily indicate what will happen in November. So much can happen before November, right? Like there, there's question marks about whether or not uh, these candidates will actually debate. I know that there seems to be a bit of a conflict about whether or not they'll debate on the public stage. And even something like that could have a huge impact on how people decide to vote in November. Um, so like, yeah, I, I love polls. I, I enjoy being able to see where the conversation is in this moment, but we have to remember that those polls really do only represent this moment. They're not necessarily, uh, the best litmus test for what might happen in, uh, a couple months time. We're chatting tonight, uh, about polls and, uh, and whether there's something that we should be cautious about or whether they're, you know, a reflection of the, the truth, uh, with, uh, with an individual who, uh, actually was one of those people working in a call center administering a poll. We're going to take a break for some messages and be back in two minutes. Stay with us, everyone, back in two. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Ashley Murphy is my guest tonight. She's a, uh, a theater uh, expert. She's a culture critic. She's a author. Uh, and we're chatting about a column that she wrote, an op-ed that she wrote in the Toronto Star about polls. Um, she's an American that's going to school or went to school in Canada. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have to admit, I uh, mispronounced her name the first time because her name is A-I-S. L-I-N-G, which I thought would have been Asling. And she says it's Ashling. And 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 why the difference? Yeah, so it's Irish. Uh, you know, like like a lot of uh Irish names, things like Siobhan, there can be sneaky little H sounds that kind of get in there that, that you don't necessarily expect when you see them on paper. But yep, it's it's pronounced Ashling. <laughs> Ashling, sneaky little H sounds. That sounds great. Um, so you're from Maryland. Yes, I am. And and you live in Toronto now? Mm-hmm. And you went to school at University of Ottawa for theater. Yep. Why would someone from Maryland go to the University of Ottawa for theater? <laughs> um, at the time, the University of Ottawa had a really good French immersion program. I mean, they sure do, but um, they still do. But they had a, a program for international students specifically, where if you took most of your courses taught in French, you didn't have to pay international tuition. Um, so for me, I you know grew up uh, taking French. I really loved the French language and I wanted to improve my French skills. Um, so going to the U University of Ottawa meant that I would get to do that for quite cheaply and I'd still get to get a degree in something else while very much improving my French. So it, uh, I'm not sure if that program exists anymore. I think they might have gotten rid of it, but I really enjoyed being able to do that. and It was great. And you moved to uh, Ottawa in 2016? Yep. And so eight years later, you're still here. How come uh, eight years later, you're still here? 
Yeah, I mean, I kind of fell into journalism in probably my third year of undergrad. Um, I started doing theater criticism and very much fell in love with it. So I, since then, I've really been building a career as an arts journalist mostly and theater critic as well. Um, and then, of course, uh, last year I did marry my Canadian husband. <laughs> so that's, of course, part of my long term stay as well. That's part of a long term stay. Uh, so have you taken out Canadian citizenship? Not yet. Uh, I'm currently waiting for my permanent residency. Um, so that paperwork is kind of in the mail. Um, but uh, no, for now, I'm I'm still on a kind of series of work permits while I wait for more long term immigration. I'm Canadian and and uh, went to school and lived in the United States for mm. uh, uh, not eight years, but almost eight years. Um, and it really gave me an interesting perspective on my home country. Um, mm. Have you got a different perspective on the United States after being in Canada for eight years? Oh, 100%. I mean, I, listen, I moved to Canada in August of 2016. Of course, I, I couldn't really have known how wild American politics were going to get after I moved. Um, I certainly didn't move for political reasons. I'd say arguably, I kind of stayed here for political reasons. Um, but I mean, you know, doing these polls and these surveys in a Canadian call center, um, and really kind of connecting with portions of my home country that I had never really been to before or or, or engaged with in, in a real way. I, I That for sure changed my perspective on American politics. I think like a lot of people uh, sort of my age and in my circle were really pretty certain that Hillary Clinton was going to win in 2016 because that's what we saw in our echo chambers, right? That's what we saw in our bubbles. Um, but the longer I was doing this job in Ottawa, the more I saw that that was certainly not the case. Uh, and of course, I mean, I have built a career in journalism in Canada. So a lot of that has been looking at the US and looking at US politics, but with that kind of border in between. So um, I'd say in some ways I, I feel more connected to the United States than I maybe did while living there, which sounds crazy to say, but I, I certainly follow politics more closely than I did when I lived there. Um, and yeah, I, I definitely look at it in a different way, I think. <laughs> My my kids are probably your age, and it's interesting. They're into politics quite a bit, and they often will watch Fox News as well as CNN uh, because they want to see what that other side of uh, the political spectrum is thinking and saying. Um, do you think many Americans actually know what the other echo chamber is thinking and saying? I think there's a lot of assumptions about that. I don't, I don't want to uh, speak on anyone's behalf, of course, but I, I think when we sort of reduce, uh, you know, polar sides of the political spectrum to their sound bites, to their main talking points, to the sort of memes we see on social media and TikTok, I think that can be dangerous, to be honest. Um, you know, I, we have to remember that there are contexts to all of these things. You know, I don't want to quote Kamala Harris and her kind of infamous context quote in the coconut tree. But I mean, we have to remember that, you know, the, there are people who have grown up in really different circumstances from us and even within the same country. I mean, the United States is huge. There are such, I mean, even just geographically, there are such huge differences in how folks grow up and, and what their value systems turn out to be. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I think people might think that they understand the talking points on the other side. I also think that there might be a little more nuance than we tend to see in a 24 hour news cycle where it's like, no, we really have to remember, you know, so much of this comes back to who raised you, where they raised you. Did they have access to, uh, you know, grocery stores and things like that, uh, public transit, um, you know, if you grew up with those things, they seem like no big deal. But if you didn't, they really, it's a completely different story. So yeah, I think there just needs to be a little more potentially empathy on both sides in terms of how different folks might be coming to the conclusions that they are politically. But you're, you're a journalist and you're a theater critic. And, uh, you know, I take a look at Canadian news and maybe I'm completely biased in this regard, but I took a, I, I take a look at Canadian news almost across the board, and I think it's news. And I take a look at CNN and Fox and uh, MSNBC or uh, M whatever it is, um, and um, and I think it's theater. Yeah, I mean, 100%. Um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, TV news is still TV. They still want people to keep watching. Um, so yeah, there's a certain kind of gamified element to how we look at politics. And I think this is true in Canadian media as well. Um, but yeah, it, it absolutely is theater. You're, you're dead on. Is that good or bad? 
Ooh, a million dollar question. Um, I mean, I think it can be good because it keeps people engaged. Um, like I don't want to, I don't want to reject the theatrics of Canadian media out of hand because, you know, if that's what gets someone to know about an important, uh, policy or other something else happening in the news cycle I think that can be okay um I just also think that there maybe should be you know, less desperate ways of, of getting readers and viewers attention um you know I there's certainly a decline in media literacy as time continues to progress which has me worried and I I you know often wish that uh larger media channels could engage their their uh audiences without having to resort to name calling and and these uh very clippable and very quotable shows that often i think are kind of manufactured to be that way um i think a lot of the things we see turned into memes were kind of meant to be turned into memes in a way that not everyone uh engages with um but yeah whether or not that's a net good or bad for society i'm not really sure um and i think it kind of changes day to day when polls um you know poll everybody and we only have you know, in the Canadian last election, I think it was 40% and the provincial election was like 30 something percent to turnout. Can they be accurate? I think they can be more accurate and, and that changes depending on how surveys get their data. I mean, I think for instance, like when I was doing surveys um, and polls in Ottawa, a lot of the people we were calling happened to be people with landlines. Um, like we were calling landline phone numbers and obviously, you know, fewer and fewer people have landlines and there's certain demographic correlations between who has a landline and who doesn't. Um, so I know, you know, in the past, gosh, eight years, I'm sure that um, these companies have changed how they get their data. And I'd be curious to see how that's affected accuracy. Um, but I think at the end of the day, as much as these polls and surveys strive for accuracy, again, there always needs to be an element of media literacy when uh, everyday citizens engage with these polls. Like, again, they very much demonstrate how the public might be feeling on a given day, but they aren't a crystal ball and they don't necessarily predict what might happen in the future. Because again, especially in a political cycle as kind of seismic and polar as this one, you know, it really feels like every day is a new campaign. Every day is a new election where the smallest kind of blip in the news cycle could really completely change the outcome of the election. We just don't know. I don't even know if my kids have ever used a landline. I think they know what one is. Um, they certainly don't have one, but I don't think they've ever actually even used a landline. Um, how can you poll people under the age of you know 30 or 35 if they don't have landlines and they don't even know what they are let alone use them well i mean i i, I suppose there's the obvious where more people i would say have a cell phone and they're they're you know have have that with them all the time um i've seen polls uh that use um, like text to response and that's great um because again that's just a little more accessible for folks i mean a lot of the surveys that i did when i worked in this call center were like 40 minutes, 50 minutes. There was one that was an hour. That's a lot of time to ask of people who don't necessarily want to be called at, you know, six, seven o'clock at night. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, uh, advancements, uh, where, you know, we're, we're calling cell phones where we're, uh, texting people for polling. I think that might be a little better. It's not perfect, but again, it's not limiting a sample response to folks who have landlines. I, you weren't in Canada during the 2015 uh, federal election in Canada, but uh, if the same people that had gone out in the previous elections had gone out in 2015, Stephen Harper would have won the election. But what ended up happening is there's a whole bunch of new people, young people, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, newcomers to Canada that came out to vote and uh, and Trudeau, uh, uh, Justin Trudeau ended up winning because of that increased turnout that was primarily uh, younger uh, more ethnic, more newcomer that voted liberal. Uh, I think the statistics are that uh, Barack Obama had a similar kind of impact uh, in his first election, that it was an increase in uh, in turnout, primarily uh, um, uh, among black Americans, excuse me, and uh, and uh, and and non-white Americans, that uh, that was the reason why Barack Obama uh, um, won. My sense of the media reporting on the United States in the last uh, you know, six months is that a lot of young people were just not engaged in the, the US election. 
um, and that the uh, the change in the top of the Democratic ticket from uh, Biden to uh, Kamala Harris has potentially changed that. What do you think? Is turnout amongst young people going to be the same or is it going to go up in November? Yeah, I mean, my hope is that it goes up. And I mean, based on what I'm sort of seeing across the, uh, across the political spectrum, it's, you know, all signs point to this being a pretty engaged election for Gen Z voters and 100% uh, post Biden kind of stepping aside to make room for Harris. I think there's been a huge surge in momentum that I, I sort of hope that the Democratic Party can keep up through November. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, like my experience voting in elections, so I'm 26. Uh, I voted in the 2016 election by mail. I voted in the 2020 election by mail. I'll vote this year by mail. Like I, you know, it's, I, I do have that removed to an extent, but I mean, certainly based on what I'm seeing online and I'm trying to go beyond my immediate bubble, I'm trying to go beyond what TikTok wants to feed me and, and sort of search for things myself. I mean, it seems like folks my age are really excited about this election and that's great. I just hope we can keep that going um, far further into uh, Harris's candidacy than just the first couple of crazy weeks that we've had. <laughs> what do you think about her uh, VP pick? I think it's great. <laughs> I, I was uh, pretty excited to wake up to that news yesterday. Um, you know, Why? she had... Sorry, go ahead. Why? Yeah, I mean, she had an amazing roster of folks to choose from. Um, you know, I, I, I think like many, I was following along to, uh, every day to see how she had narrowed her picks into, you know, there's five people, there's three people. Um, and with Tim Walls, I think he brings a certain relatability to uh, that portion of the country that obviously will be important for swing states. So, uh, you know, obviously that's sort of Michigan's support kind of cemented, but then, I mean, there's Michigan, even maybe Ohio and Pennsylvania. I think there, I think Tim Walls brings a certain relatability to those parts of the country that can only strengthen the democratic ticket. Um, and, you know, uh, th the response has been, really, really great. I mean, I think a lot of his policies are progressive without uh, being too much of a reach. Uh, the things he's been able to do as governor of Minnesota, I mean, his free lunch and breakfast program, for instance, uh, you're, you're not seeing too many Democratic politicians who are able to get that level of work done. Of course, a lot of politicians will talk about these incredibly progressive policies that are great ideas, but then can't happen uh, uh, practically. Um, but with Tim Walls, he's actually been able to make stuff happen. So I'm I'm very optimistic about him uh, being her VP pick and, you know, kind of fingers crossed to see him uh, in, in the White House, because I think he's great. The uh, relatability issue. Why is that important? Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately, you know, we're talking about folks uh, e e empathizing and understanding life experiences outside their own. Um, I think the realities of Kamala Harris being a Black woman are real for, you know, plenty of spots in the country that are ultimately still uh, pretty flat in terms of their cultural rep representation, right? So if Tim Walls is someone who maybe looks a little more like the folks who might not be sure how to vote this November, that could be a deciding factor in someone voting for the Democrats rather than Donald Trump. So I, I think this was a very strategic uh, pick for Kamala Harris. And ultimately, I think it was a pretty smart one. I'm, I hope that we kind of see it pay off. I uh, went to undergraduate in uh, Canada and uh... University of Western Ontario. And we thought, you know, we were different people from Toronto, Montreal, Calgary, et cetera. Um, but uh, we were pretty similar um, uh, in our political outlook and our outlook on life, et cetera. I then went to graduate school in the United States and, um, you know, had to interact with people from across the United States and was astounded at how different people from, you know, Ivy League educations in New York were from uh, people in, uh, in Texas and Kansas and Alabama. The diversity in the United States, I think, is is not something that a lot of Canadians appreciate. What do you think to that? Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I mean, even I can sometimes forget just how huge the, the United States are. And I mean, uh, anytime I kind of travel back home or, or travel across the U.S., I'm, I'm reminded that 
you know, the U.S. has been there for uh, l longer than Canada in some ways. And of course, by that, I mean, uh, sort of developed colonized America has been there longer than developed colonized Canada, which I know is a can of worms, but I think is important to point out. Um, yeah, so there, there's been longer for things like suburbs to develop and blossom. There's been longer for cities to sort of age and, and gain a personality. Um, I, I love Toronto, but I'm often kind of reminded of the fact that it's a pretty young city, all things considered. Um, and while the U.S., you know, compared to, you know, places in Europe or whatever is, is quite young as well, there is that extra time that really kind of reminds me like, oh, there's a little there's a longer recorded history here than where I currently live. So yeah, I, I'm always fascinated to kind of see the differences between the US and Canada in that way. You have got a really eclectic writing uh, background portfolio of what you <laughs> write on. And as I've uh, perused your uh, your uh, LinkedIn, it's quite amazing. You know what? I think I can take a break for some messages. I'm going to come back and ask you about some of the, the past columns that you've uh, written, if that's okay. Sure. We're going to come back with uh, Ashleen Murphy, not Aisling Murphy, but Ashleen Murphy in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest, and my guest tonight is uh, Ashleen Murphy. She's an award-winning arts and culture journalist. Uh, she's a theater critic. Uh, she's written a really interesting op-ed in the Toronto Star about polls and her experience uh, working in a call center. But in her journalism, she actually writes a lot of other really different and, and interesting articles. And so maybe just for a couple of minutes, we can uh, chat about that. You wrote an interesting article about... Uh, about how Taylor Swift's superfan turned her love of the pop star into a dream career. Tell me about that. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I write about Taylor Swift quite frequently in my capacity as a culture writer. It's kind of one of my favorite parts of the job. Um, I've been writing about Taylor Swift professionally for a couple of years now, which is kind of crazy. Um, but so for this story, um, Kelsey Barnes is a fellow Taylor Swift journalist. Um, she's from Burlington, Ontario, but she splits her career uh, between London in the UK uh, and then Toronto. Um, we've really gotten to be friends over the past couple of years, which has been great. Um, but she was appointed a professional super fan for the VNA Museum in the UK, which is on, it's a huge honor. It's a really cool thing for her to get to do. Um, so I wrote the story kind of profiling Kelsey and talking about how she very much turned her fandom for Taylor Swift into a career, which I mean, is honestly inspiring to me. And just it's been very cool to see how she's been able to turn something that she genuinely loves so passionately into something that can also further and, and um, sort of complement her writing career. It's really, really cool. You won an award for your journalism. Which story was it for? Yeah, um, so I uh, was the runner up in uh, 2023 for the Nathan Cohen Awards, which are distributed by the Canadian Theatre Critics Association. Um, so I got two runners up uh, last year. One was for a kind of satirical manifesto that I wrote about AI in theatre criticism. Um, obviously, there's a bit of a panic across journalism about how AI might complement or, or uh, excuse me, uh, kind of, th you know, threaten or otherwise uh, kind of confront uh, traditional written journalism. So I wrote this manifesto saying why AI would never be able to review a show. Um, so that was one. And then the other was uh, for my review of The Master Plan at Crow's Theatre, which is a show I adore. I really love writing about it. I love getting to see it uh, as much as I can. And yeah, I, I was uh, very honored uh, for those pieces to be recognized in the way that they were. You also wrote uh, about arts criticism not being dead. Tell me about that. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> um, earlier this summer, I had the absolute privilege of getting to participate in the National Critics Institute at the Eugene O'Neill Theatre Center, which is in Waterford, Connecticut. Um, and basically, it's summer camp for theatre critics, uh, which is amazing. Um, you basically spend two weeks in coastal Connecticut. You kind of live by the beach uh, in uh, supplied housing, you get to see shows every night, you review restaurants and 
uh, you review movies, you get to learn from all of these uh, really accomplished journalists. I mean, we had sessions with, I think, three Pulitzer winners, which was a dream. Um, and that experience very, really reinforced for me that arts criticism isn't dead. Um, there, there tends to be a, a bit of a narrative that, oh, you know, if, if you, you can't be a theater critic forever. It's not going to pay forever. You know, we're seeing arts criticism disappear from traditional media. And I'd say that, yeah, we're seeing it less frequently than we used to, but I also think that that can give us an opportunity to change how we frame uh, discourse around art. I think that we can per uh, perhaps embrace social media and TikTok more than uh, most uh, theater critics have thus far, I would say. Um, but yeah, I mean, this program in Connecticut very much reinforced for me, like, no, criticism is so important. Uh, being able to do criticism in dialogue with a group in that way was really helpful as well. Um, but yeah, no, that experience was just incredible. You wrote about artificial intelligence doing uh, theater reviews. Um, yes. I didn't even know that existed. Yeah, it was a kind of scary discovery when I wrote that story. Um, essentially, there were a few theaters in Toronto who on their posters and marketing graphics had included pull quotes written by AI. So, you know, you would see a positive quote from the Toronto Star, a positive quote from the Globe and Mail, and then one from this site called BNN Breaking, uh, which isn't a real news site. It's an AI content aggregator. Um, so I remember seeing these posters and being like, huh, I, you know, I'm kind of steeped in Canadian media all the time. I don't know what BNN Breaking is. I should look into this. Um, and it turned out that these theaters had kind of been duped into thinking that these were real reviews when they certainly were not. Um, so it turned into a bit of a deep dive into how is AI changing and potentially threatening uh, theater marketing and how can we be a little more aware of that happening so that we can avoid it moving forward. You lost 17 teeth? 14. <laughs> yeah, um, I... Yeah, it was kind of crazy. I was in undergrad doing my theater degree and uh, I had never lost most of my baby teeth. They had just never uh, fallen out naturally. So in 2019, I had to go back to the States for about a week and got uh, 10 baby teeth and then all four of my wisdom teeth out. So I ate a lot of soup in 2019, I would say. You wrote about uh, stump people. Uh, yeah, a while ago, um, there was a movie shooting in Burlington, um, and I went to go and, uh, watch them for a day, watch them film for a day. Um, and one of their, uh, stunt coordinators showed me how to flip another person. Um, so there's some kind of crazy photos attached to that story where it very much looks like I'm like flipping an actor. Um, but it was, yeah, that was a really fun story to get to write. In Toronto, we get a lot of, uh, you know, off broad, not broad, off Broadway, uh, sort of uh, touring Broadway uh, shows at Mervish and other theaters. And and you seem to do reviews of a lot of the the non uh, Mervish type shows, uh, uh, maybe uh, the original shows that are uh, being shown in uh, Toronto. What's your sense of the theater uh, market, the theater business in Toronto? Yeah, I mean, what's great about it is there is so much to choose from, right? Like, I, I love a big musical as much as anyone, don't get me wrong. Like, I, I uh, when Hades Town was uh, in town last summer, I saw it, I think, three times. I'm obsessed with that show. Um, but I also, you know, there's a lot of really cool uh, kind of more homegrown theater happening in Toronto. I mean, places like Soul Pepper and Crows Theater uh, are doing some of the best theater that I've ever seen, and there's not really a qualifier for that it's just like fully just a lot of the theater happening in Toronto is really really good um I love Tarragon Theater uh which is often a great place for new plays specifically and it's great to kind of see uh new written work develop from say a workshop to a final production um but yeah no I I find that if folks are willing to look just a little beyond the downtown core there's some really great theater happening uh across Toronto and uh, at times I can find can be sometimes a little more interesting and thought provoking than a big musical, which again, I do love a big musical, but I think more intimate experiences can be uh, very rewarding as well in a similar way. You also interview uh, musicians, is that correct? Yeah, when I can, for sure. Who is uh, Lizzie McAlpine? Yeah, um, she's actually coming to Toronto uh, tonight, actually. She's uh, playing uh, Budweiser stage uh, tonight and I'll be seeing her, which is great. Um, she is, how to describe her? I'd say that she's a 
kind of indie folk songwriter, I would say. Um, she's collaborated with artists like Noah Khan um, for, you know, she's known for very confessional storytelling in her lyrics and she has a beautiful voice as well. Um, yeah, I've, I've been a fan of her for years and I got to review her latest album for Exclaim back when it came out, which was a great experience. Someone that uh, we should listen to? Yeah, 100%. I'd say for fans of Taylor Swift, Gracie Abrams, um, you, you know, uh, Lizzie McAlpine tends to fall into maybe like a quieter sound. I find that her music isn't overproduced in uh, a way I find a lot of uh, pop music can be these days. Um, but yeah, I, I find just the quality of her music to be fantastic. And I, I appreciate what she's able to do with a more stripped down sound. I was shocked at the attention that uh, this new uh, Taylor Swift uh, album uh, received. And you wrote a whole article about the Tortured Poets Department. And you described it as a gorgeous, chaotic, messy, irreverent album of heartbreak and manic glee. Just stunning. Really? Yeah. I mean, I would say I, I stand by it. I mean, that was my review for the Toronto Star. Um, that album... I know that it's polarizing um, and I think that, you know, I've seen criticisms of the album for its production being repetitive. I happen to disagree with that. I found it to be a very sonically cohesive album. I think the 31 tracks, yes, it's a little long in scope, but I also think that, you know, the fans kind of ate that up. Um, you know, no one, no one who's a Taylor Swift fan is saying, oh, this is, this is too many songs. I wish, I wish I had fewer new Taylor Swift songs to listen to. Um, you know, I can't, I, I can't say that I'm not a Taylor Swift fan. I very much am. Um, I, you know, I try to hold her music to the same standard that I would any other uh, musician whose work I'd be reviewing. But I genuinely found the Tortured Poets Department. I think it's a great album. There's uh, radio friendly hits on there. There's some really interesting deep cuts happening there. I appreciate how self-referential this album is. I find that she gets a little kind of satirical and ironic in terms of talking about how uh, her fan base has kind of gotten to be a lot over the past couple of years, especially. Um, but no, I mean, that album is still in my daily rotation from what music I listen to. And I genuinely think it's a great album. Have you gone to Seer? Yeah, so I saw the Eras tour in Nashville last summer. Um, and before that, I was able to see her when she spoke at TIFF in 2022, um, which was one of my first kind of bigger stories for the Toronto Star and was amazing. I mean, she gave like an hour long lecture uh, for like 200 people, 300 people. It was a pretty small auditorium. So it was very interesting to get to hear her talk uh, in such an intimate space and setting. It was great. What did she say? Yeah, she was talking about um, her, the short film uh, for her song, All Too Well. Um, so it's the 10 minute version of All Too Well uh, that she did sort of as a gift to the fans when she re-released her album, Red. Um, but in this talk, she really got into some of the filmmaking behind this short film. Um, it got surprisingly technical in places. I mean, like we were really get, getting into cinematography, lighting, like much of uh, more of the minutia of filmmaking. So it was great to sort of hear her chatting about something that she doesn't talk about as much. Like, obviously, we've heard plenty of deep dives into her songwriting process and her musical creative process. Um, but to hear her actually get into the nuts and bolts of filmmaking was really interesting. I know of someone who uh, was desperate to see her and uh, tried to get a ticket in Toronto and Vancouver and the United States couldn't do it and is off right now in Vienna to see her in Vienna. Is that crazy? I don't think it's crazy. Um, you know, I think that tickets uh, were a lot cheaper in Europe. Uh, you know, I certainly considered uh, doing something similar and and taking a summer trip to Europe to to take advantage of cheaper tickets. Um, you know, ultimately, I mean, so many of the Eras tour tickets have ended up on StubHub for thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. I mean, for some of the better seats on the resale market right now, you have the choice of you can see Taylor Swift or you can buy a car. I mean, the price tags attached to these tickets are wild um, and really unregulated to a pretty problematic extent, I would say. Um, so no, I mean, I certainly have friends who have traveled far and wide to see Taylor Swift. And I, I don't think it's crazy. I think if, you know, she's an artist who has really touched people in a, in a significant way. And if that's how they choose to engage with that, I think, why not? We're having a fun conversation, at least I am, with uh, 
Ashton Murphy. She's a theater critic. She's an author. She's a journalist. She's written a really interesting article uh, recently about polling in the United States. And after a break, we're going to come back and chat a little bit more about American politics. But you've also got a really interesting array of articles uh, that you've written on a whole bunch of interesting different topics and, and theater. If people want to follow you, uh, what's the best way for them to do that? Is that is there a website that you post all your articles on or how can one best uh, follow uh, Ashton Murphy? Yeah, I mean, best way to find me is uh, probably through my website, which is just ashleymurphy.ca. Um, and then I'm also on uh, Twitter and Instagram. So if folks want to find me there, they're welcome to. <laughs> We're going to take a break and be back for some concluding comments in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I'm having a lot of fun uh, tonight interviewing Ashley Murphy, who uh, I came across when she wrote a really interesting article. As many of you know, I'm a political junkie, and she wrote this article about uh, polls and uh, her experience uh, in a call center and her caution that uh, we shouldn't get too wedded to the belief uh, that polls are completely accurate uh, and that uh, things can change over time and uh, and based on turnout and a whole bunch of other uh, uh, issues, particularly in the very diverse United States. Um, but as I delved into her background, uh, you know, she's written a bunch of really interesting articles on a bunch of different topics that we've just chatted about. Um, Ashley, I got to ask you what you think is going to happen in the course of the next couple of months in the United States. You know, I, as a lot of people probably have been shocked about what's happened in just the last month. Um, you know, we've had uh, uh, a, a Biden-Trump uh, campaign that uh, a lot of people weren't excited about, a, a, a attempted assassination. Uh, J.D. Vance, uh, who uh, looked like he was going to be spectacular, but then looks like he's flamed out. Um, uh, Biden leaving, Kamala Harris coming in, and now a, a new uh, VP nominee. You know, like how much more can change in the next six months or four months I think it's 90 something days uh, versus what we've experienced over the course of the last um, month or so. Tell me what you think we have to look forward to or look out for. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm kind of waiting for the for the answer to that as much as everyone else. Uh, as you quite rightly said, I mean, this election has been really fast paced in a kind of disquieting way. Um, so we really like, it almost feels like we don't know from week to week. I mean, for me. I will be very curious to see how the debate debate uh, settles down. And by that, I just mean, you know, uh, I know that Donald Trump has agreed to debate Kamala Harris for Fox. She has agreed to debate him for ABC. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. I, I really couldn't predict with any degree of certainty right now. Um, I mean, the momentum I think that we're seeing for the Kamala Harris campaign is really exciting and I hope that it continues. It's just also, I mean, they, you know, they have under a hundred days to run a campaign that is really, really important and needs to be done really well. So I, I'm cheering on as much as I can from Canada, but I, I'm also aware that this is a very high stakes and very turbulent election where I think trying to predict too, too far into the future may not be helpful at this point because we don't know what else may still happen in the next couple of months. Um, as a sort of Canadian, since you're living here now, uh, who's better for Canada, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I probably Kamala Harris, I would say. I mean, I think that there's such uh, a relationship between yeah Canada and the US that, I mean, I think when things are better south of the border, they tend to be better north of the border as well. Um, you know, I... I can very much compare my first four years in Canada with my second four years in Canada. And I'd say that the second four have certainly been a little uh, calmer uh, coming up from the US. So I, yeah, I would, I would say that, you know, whatever good Kamala Harris has kind of promised or, or pledged to do for the US, I would hope that that would sort of uh, ripple in, into Canada and in as much as American politics already do. Last question. You also wrote an article about your father and he got to interview the Beach Boys. Really? Sort of. Yeah. So he um, was a session musician with the Beach Boys for a little bit. Um, my dad has had an eclectic career and he uh, was writing jingles uh, and recording jingles in Manchester uh, when he was younger. Um, and his producer at one point was like, hey, do you want to not 
right you, you know you don't have to do jingles but um can you go fill in uh for the beach boys for a couple of performances um so we got to know the beach boys that way and through dennis wilson in particular he was able to research and then interview charles manson um this it was a really crazy story and it was something that i grew up kind of hearing about but had never really gotten into the finer details with my dad about it um so for father's day this year i wound up writing a story for the star where i actually got to interview my dad about this thing that i knew a little bit about just because i'd kind of heard it growing up but really kind of you know journalistically get into the no what happened why did you interview charles manson how was that for you um which is a very cool experience and he got to play with the Beach Boys. He did, yeah. Now that would be a dream come true for me. <laughs> What's the next article? Oh, good question. I mean, there's a few coming up in the pipeline. Um, I just had the chance to sit down with a New York Times bestselling author over the weekend. Um, so that should be up sometime this week. Um, I just finished a story for CBC, which I think went out yesterday. Um, there are several South Asian actors across Canada playing Hamlet at the moment. Um, there's a, it's a really interesting kind of coincidence or uh, trend, depending on how you look at it. Um, and so I got to chat with three of them about uh, Hamlet and all the intricacies of Hamlet, which was great. And of course, I mean, I review quite quite a bit of Toronto theater. So, you know, as soon as the season kind of starts back up again in a couple of weeks, I'll be reviewing several times a week again, which will be great. <laughs> Ashley Murphy, thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. This was great. That's our show for tonight, everybody. Thank you for joining. I remind you, I'm on every Monday through Friday at six o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online either from downtown Toronto or from Maryland at www.saga960am.ca. <laughs> All my podcasts and videos go up on social media and YouTube and podcast servers as soon as the radio share, the radio show gets uh, gets broadcast. Uh, so see you tomorrow. Thanks, Aslan. Good night. Thank you.